you were in South Africa five years ago in 2019 and apparently you nearly died. I pop my head out of the water and I go back down and it is there. It was not there and then it was there. It was that fast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. This is season four, and I've actually managed to drag somebody in who was last on the podcast in season one. I can't believe it's been three years. It's 2024 already. Andy Winkler, it's welcome back, man. It's my pleasure to return to the, to the Rhinoplasty Podcast with Cameron McIntosh. It is, <laughs> it is an honor and a privilege. That's so cool. <laughs> so listen, we've got this little rhino here eh, as our memento. You were in South Africa five years ago in 2019, and apparently you nearly died. Yeah, I was, I was just mentioning um, there were two instances. One was a great white shark. So they chummed the water. We were in the cage. They told us we may not see anything the whole time. And I popped my head out of the water because, you know, you have to go up for air. <laughs> and I go back down, and it is there. It was not there, and then it was there. It was that fast and smooth, and the uh, body of this great white hit the cage, and we're all just like screaming and yelling, and it was a fantastic experience. Wow. So that was the, the time number one, and then there was actually, I just remember another time I almost died. Um, another time I almost died in South Africa was when um, we were watching the elephants, yeah. and the guide says, you know, the elephants are used to the silhouette of the, of the vehicle. Um, and you should not, you know, break that silhouette. They will find that as alarming. And of course, I'm trying to like get my camera, yeah, yeah. just the right yeah, yeah. picture. And this big, um, what are the female elements called? The matriarch. Yes, the big matriarch, I suppose, sees me and her ears just do this. And then she starts walking toward the car. <laughs> and that guy is like, oh, no, you need to get back in the car now or get in that thing. And so as soon as we did, it was fine and, and they didn't kill us. But then the third time was when um, you roped me into running and, um, on the, um, on the uh, reserve. Yes. It yes, was about yes. 1,000 degrees. I believe that's how my recollection is. You roped me into running on the reserve. And we had to have an armed guard follow behind in the Jeep um, so that we could go for our run, you know. On the on the premises, and uh, no, it was fine. It yeah, was but fun. yes, it's amazing. I mean, that was a great meeting we had. Eh? And Amy came out with you, your wife, yes, as well. That's eh? right. Yeah. yeah, she loved it. I mean, we talked about it still to this day, and how fortunate we were to get it in before you know the pandemic. Yes, yes, it was literally a few months before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Really so, was. Andy, tell me. I mean, so what else has changed in your life since then? I mean, we were speaking off air about a couple of things. Ah, uh, yes, so much. So. Professionally, um, one major recent change, which has been very positive, has been I have a new boss for the first time in my life. So, you know, in an academic center, we have the chairman, in this case, a chairwoman. And it's high time, and she's first and foremost exceptionally qualified for the job. Yeah. Um, she brings a lot of research, um, a lot of leadership to our department, um, very energetic, and I think she's going to do a fantastic job. Not just saying that. Um, so that's a new thing for me because up until this point, I've had one boss, you know, for the last 15 years. Um, so this is going to inevitably bring about change. Yes. Um, there is no doubt about it. Yeah. Anytime you have a changing of the leadership, there will be change throughout the whole system. Yeah. So we're navigating that right now and seeing kind of where we can go. And one of the things I'm excited about is... Um, um, my my new boss, the new chairperson, is uh, Yuri Agrawal, and Yuri is uh, very much a proponent of fellowship programs at, okay. at teaching institutions, which is where I work. I work at the University of Colorado in the United States. So this has always been a dream of mine, um, but I've been hesitant, and I'm curious to see what you think of this. I've been hesitant to kind of pull the trigger, even though I've been very involved with our fellowship program at the in in the United States. Yes in the academy um, because I wanted it to be a fellowship that I wanted to go to. Yes. You know, I wanted it to be something that I would look at this fellowship and be like, that's where I want to be. Not just geography because Denver, Colorado is a lovely place to be yeah. for a year, but 
also just has the wide breadth and you're, you're working with several different mentors. You get a lot of different experiences, maybe some global out, outreach, kind of global health kind of things. Um, and you have a lot of different experiences to, to kind of, you know, round out the fellowship year. So I have been hesitant to that, but now at 15 years into my, into my practice, I feel like I'm there. And it coincides with Yuri, my, my new chairperson, um, taking this job and really kind of wanting to see that. So I think this is a, uh, a good, you know, confluence, a good time to, time to do this. But we're very much starting. Um, and I know you have a fellowship. Whoa. So how did that go? So we have doing a first time ever in South Africa, yes. having a facial plastics it's fellowship. And it's, it's like, maybe before I speak about myself, if I look at the, your perspective, Annie, it's a no brainer. I mean, why not? Yeah. What an incredible thing. I think our lives as we evolve in rhinoplasty, where we learn, you know, it's that old adage of like, see one, do one, teach one. For me, I would love to be your fellow man. <laughs> Imagine coming to Colorado and learning from Andy Winkler. Wow, it'd be great. So I, in my mind, absolutely make it happen. I had a very, very interesting chat with Roxana Kobo mm. a couple of episodes back where they've started a fellowship program with three directors and the, the fellow spends four months at a time in different areas in Colombia and they have an online Zoom meeting for an hour and a half every Thursday and the fellow has to present the paper in English and they can ask them questions about it. So they have 52 meetings a year, one every month. And then the, every three months they get together for like a weekend of academics. So I, I think that's a very cool way to go. So we've just started. Marshall Murdoch is a plastic surgeon who got the highest marks at the board exams last year and myself. So we geographically about 200 miles apart. And uh, Steve Wilson is a plastic surgeon, he's our first fellow. And so Steve's learning mostly rhinoplasty from me. And then it'll be more on the aging face stuff from Marsh. So it's, yeah, he's our guinea pig. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's been hard. It's, we got funding from yeah. Carl Stortz, which is absolutely awesome. And um, it's been a pleasure because I think the big thing for me, I guess, is it's also up my game because the guy asks insightful questions, you know, and, and he keeps pushing you. So you realize that you also have to be performing. You can't just say and not do. Right. So I've enjoyed it. No, it's been absolutely fantastic. Right. Yeah. And, and I work at a place that has residents right now, um, but this will be, you know, in my opinion, sort of the right level for teaching of the things that I do. Yeah. Um, I feel like sometimes in the residency program, um, you know, the residents aren't necessarily as interested in these very kind of small minutia parts of facial plastic surgery. And, you know, it's, it's good to be exposed to those things, but it's not necessarily something that they have to learn. Okay, so the question in your fellowship were you to do it, what would be the key selling points for you? Clinically, like from a clinical, why should somebody come and have a fellowship underneath you? I like the idea of having um, many different surgeons you work with. So you okay. see lots of different ways to do things. So that would be one, lots of different, as you say, directors um, mm. that, uh, that they can work with. Another one would be the breadth. I, I, aspire to have a wide breadth of facial plastic surgery procedures that we're able mm -hmm. to do, which would include, of course, rhinoplasty, aging face, um, facial nerve, um, hopefully exposure to cleft lip and palate, um, free flap, you know, free tissue transfer, um, gender um, uh, affirmation surgery. I mean, there's the, the whole gamut of what I consider facial plastic surgery or you know, we would consider. So that I think would be good. And then I would love to have people in the community have an opportunity for them to work in, in, in the community as well. Um, maybe not like super regularly, but at least some exposure, maybe a, you know, a few weeks here and there, um, where they can get a private practice. Because that's kind of how it's differentiated in, our, in my country. It's like academic and private practice, okay. university and private practice. So it would be, that would be my dream. Okay, so now what, what do you think about this comment? You can just tell me if I'm talking rubbish or not. Yeah. But there's a perception that Europe's kind of taking the lead now in the world of rhinoplasty, mm -hmm. not necessarily facial plastics, but in the rhinoplasty compared to where this incredibly strong American like, behemoth has been for many years. Yeah. 
yeah. but there's now like a nimbleness from a lot of the top European surgeons. They're doing some incredible work. Uh, I mean, this whole wave of different kinds of preservation surgeries, etc. It's is it true to say that that hasn't really gained traction as much as it should have in the States? If you ask specifically about preservation, yes, I would say that has not gained traction as much. Um, it is definitely talked about. I think there's a lot of discussion about it. Um, but I think um, relative to the first statement, I think there is now more surgeons doing rhinoplasty outside of the U.S. And that's something that's changed over, you know, since the 80s. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And that just makes that voice much more prominent. Yeah. Um, I don't know that the things that are being done are drastically different from country to country. Yeah. I mean, I think we all kind of do 90% of the surgery is the same, you know, yeah. but there are 10% that is nuanced and is different. And again, of course, it's the results that really matter, um, and exactly how you get there. So now tell me another question. You used to be like directing the fellowship program. Yeah. So what, what did that entail? The, the title was Chair of the Fellowship Committee of the AFPRS. So the Fellowship Committee uh, was involved with um, sort of in uh, hearing the complaints or the concerns of fellows about fellowship programs and how we can improve the policies that we have. Um, so all the, um, all the fellowships have to adhere to policies that are put down, put in place by the AFPRS. And so we change those policies over time based on what kind of things come up, what, what issues uh, arise. Um, we had subcommittees that we were working with to um, perhaps you've heard of the curriculum compendium. It's yeah. like just this big, you know, reservoir of all these um, papers that we think are core papers. And so we always are updating that. That was one of the subcommittees. Um, and about, you know, many, many different things. But essentially it all came down to making the fellowship experience as good as possible in the United States. That's kind of what it was. Um, and there's lots of different arms to that, as you can imagine. Um, but it was kind of a 30,000 feet, 10,000 meter um, view of wow. fellowships. But in, in our country, as it is, I'm sure, with you and other places, the, the relationship between a fellow and a fellowship director is a contract in and of itself. So we have no author, authorization or authority to like tell them what to do. This is their employee-employer contract. Okay. But that employer has to abide by a certain set of rules and policies, and that's kind of what, what I was doing. Wow. So that's kind of how it was, but you really learn a lot about, you know, what are some good things to do, what are yeah. some bad things to do. But that makes you in the perfect position to put together yeah. your fellowship. Program. Well, you do learn about, like, some of the problems that arise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that you're ever going to have any Ooh, of these. No, 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 no. I'm <laughs> waiting for the problems. <laughs> just, but there is some starts and stops, right? Yeah, there's yeah. some, there's some, um, you know, some wrong turns, shall we say. Yeah. And like you have to kind of, okay, I learned from that. This is not the way to do it. And the yeah. fellows are telling me that I need to do something different. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's kind of where really there was the most problems is when a fellowship director yeah. was unwilling to change what they do. And, you know, times change. The fellows coming through change. Um, social media was a big deal. Okay, so question, last question. Mm -hmm. Should you go and start this fellowship, which I hope you're gonna be doing, okay? Uh, I mean, and there's guys listening all around the world. Is this thing limited to somebody who lives in the US or would it be an international thing? Absolutely not, international, absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, international, um, we have an amazing cadaver experience on, on campus. We actually bring in lots of different um, entities like stores and different business yeah, entities. Yeah. In fact, this is kind of cool. Can I give you one example? Of course. Um, so I was approached by this company who is beta testing a new type of bovi. I know, I'm putting your listeners to sleep right now. No, 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 but, no, no, yeah, yeah. But this was cool. Okay, so what they did, it wasn't just an electric cautery. What it did is it created electric cautery, but it had this electrical field that it created around the tip. The idea is that it didn't need smoke evacuation. So what it did is it ionized the smoke particles as it was coming off of the cautery. No and then those ionized smoke particles would fall down to the, to the surface of the wound. Yeah. So there was no smoke. 
So you use Connery, and it's a big deal in our country because we have to, you know, we have all these rules. Oh, I mean, I mean you imagine those guys are doing the tummy tucks, and exactly. it's right. like a, it's like a barbecue going on in theater, man. <laughs> yes, and and everyone's worried about lung cancer and all this kind of stuff. So what they 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 developed this thing, and they're still developing it. So they brought a bunch of surgeons in, and they had a pig under anesthesia, like I don't know, two hundred pound pig, this huge pig, under anesthesia with a vet anesthesiologist. And different specialties were coming in. So there was a general surgeon doing like endoscopic or laparoscopic things. Yeah. And then I came in and kind of did like a fake facelift on the pig and that kind of stuff. Um, but just to kind of check it out and look at the ergonomics of it and see yeah. how well it's working. And would I like this? And they asked, you know, about 100 questions about their product. So it was kind of cool. But that's my point in telling you this story is like this is a great opportunity again for a fellow where we have um, access to a cadaver lab that's really state-of-the-art, top-notch. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of that practice that can go on there, too. So, yes, that's a long-winded answer. Yes, I would love to have international fellows. Um, there's, of course, rules, and we're just starting. And it's not just me. It's me and my partners who are all kind of thinking about this together. Um, my partner is Dr. Trella, Dr. Farrell. And so we are kind of putting our heads together, seeing how this would work, how we're going to get Pete, this fellow to different parts of the city, different you know yeah, yeah. locations and that kind of thing. Oh, Andy, that's great. Eh? Yeah. I wish you luck. I think I'm going to have to yeah, yeah. have to interview the fellow after his first year and ask him what it was like. Or yeah. she. <laughs> he or she is going to have to uh, sign a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Andy, it's so nice to catch up with you again. And yeah, um, yeah man, I hope uh, everything works out from your side. And thanks for sharing everything you do thanks. on the podcast. And yeah. what yeah, you do. Thank you for having me on your, your podcast. Wonderful. Wonderful to be with you. Thanks for doing it. Nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. Guys, make sure you come back again next week for another episode of the Rhino Polosti Podcast. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.